started. Some others will come back in as we finish up with your duties. And uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, this is the second session of the morning. It's uh, going to be the same thing all week. As I announced earlier, all four mornings. And then uh, Saturday morning as well, that 9.30 hour I think it is, or something like that. Uh, the last uh, seminar on Saturday morning before our closing service. So uh, I do need to uh, remind you, those that have children, that uh, don't pick them up where you left them off up here. They will be older. Than I know you can pick them up over there. And K through six. Case case K through three. six ones. Yeah. Preschool, the preschool, the nursery ones. Like, I guess you're picking them up where you left them off. Right. <laughs> that's the point. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. If you want to, that's optional. <laughs> Our meal times are 7 45, 12 15, and 5 15. So there's no real rush. We'll be out of here by 12, and if you want to play time to get over there, we'll take care of the things. So, uh, Dr. Blake Neff is our uh, lecturer for the seminar this year, and uh, I already mentioned that he uh, has children, some of you know, he has three children, all of them in ministry, the son is in the pastoral ministry, a daughter, Jan, who is a pastor's wife, and another daughter, Joanna, who is a missionary with her husband under World Gospel Mission. Today he brought his wife, Nancy, and uh, they've been in ministry together for ever. And uh, Ruth and I are good personal friends with them. So we're glad they're here. They're going to talk about being overcomers. And what's the overcomers with them. So uh, that's going to be the summer topic this year. And there's materials for everybody. So if you didn't get one, raise your hand. We'll make sure to okay. raise it high so they can see your hand. Which of the both of Okay, Father, we give this time to you. We're thankful for it and pray that you will just minister to our hearts all week long and help uh, Dr. Neff as he shares his heart and these materials with us. It will be good for our souls. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am grateful for the opportunity and privilege to be with you. Dr. Warrior, thank you for letting me come. I appreciate that great deal. And uh, church, thanks for being here this morning. I'm not used to this hall, and hearing is something of an issue. You hear me okay in the back? Am I okay like that? All right, very good. Uh, the materials that uh, you have received, uh, just a note about those. Oftentimes when I do what I call the Overcomers Conference, uh, primarily for local churches, we send these ahead so that people have them for two weeks. You'll discover in the first section, there are 14 days of devotions that kind of help set the stage. One of the advantages of being in this crowd is you pretty well know the book and uh, know the story of Joseph from the Old Testament, and uh, that's what the Old Congress Conference is based on. In fact, if uh, you are among those folks who say it really doesn't belong here unless you read the text, say, Thus saith the Lord, and then preach it, uh, I could do that. We'd be reading today and tomorrow and Wednesday from Genesis uh, 37 all the way to 50. Uh, but I think you have some idea of those accounts and uh, Joseph's foray down into Egypt and how he saved two nations as a result. Then the middle section is what you'd be primarily interested in these mornings. There's a uh, outline. Uh, note taking guide for people who learn best that way in the middle section. And we'll be uh, this morning on page 28 uh, of that note taking section. And then you'll notice uh, that there are at the end, in the third section, some discussion questions so that if you want to get together with people and talk about uh, the things that we've learned or the things that we've discussed, and those really work well also in local churches for the very simple reason that, that it can become an ongoing kind of study uh, after we've come in for four or five days and done. Then just for this conference, I inserted a couple of pages. Uh, the blue page you will uh, see is about uh, having a conference in your church if you're interested. Uh, but the thing that you might be interested in is that this, these mornings, we're going to combine the first two of those uh, and have sessions out of each one. Uh, 
And uh, so that's kind of where we are with regard to that. And then the yellow section has a, a brief outline of some books that I put up here outside the door where we meet in the evening. Uh, no, listen to me on this, even if you don't listen to anything else. There's a, there's a chart there, or a, a stand there, that I use when I go to local churches that says all books, and it's got the price. They're just the ones on my table. I don't know how much he gets for his books. And I don't be taking Dr. Moyer's book and leaving money in my envelope because I don't know how to deal with that, how to figure that out. Uh, special word of apology uh, to Harold. He's had to listen to this once before. He invited us down to Kentucky when he was pastoring down there. And we went through this conference once there. And I just want to say to you folks how grateful I am to that man for the tremendous ministry he's had with my little brother. Uh, you still ought to be praying for my brother. He's got a ways to go yet uh, to faith in Jesus, but uh, Harold, Harold brought him a long, long ways. And Harold, I'm grateful for that. Thank you for very much. Uh, let me be among the first to welcome you to uh, Grant County. Uh, Nancy and I have been in Grant County for almost 20 years, and uh, we're, uh, we find this to be home. We've been in a variety of places, and uh, we're delighted that you've come uh, to Grant County. Those of you who came from the east in Grant County, my only regret is that you stopped just a little bit soon. Uh, if you'd gone just another 12 miles and come to the heart of the county, you would have been where people around Taylor University call the other place. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other place is where I uh, live and work. Nancy and I live at the edge of Indiana Western University campus, and I'm a lecturer in communication there, have been there full time for the last 10 years and about nine years before that as an adjunct. Some of that time I was also here trying to make up my mind which place really was the other place. But at any rate, what I'd really love to be able to do is to take all of you on a tour at Indiana Western University. Some of you know our campus and know of its beauty and know of its ministry and its vision, but it would be so much fun to be able to take you to Indiana Western University and take you on a tour. And if we did that, we'd certainly want to stop uh, at this building, the Jackson Library. And this particular shot of the Jackson Library shows, you see the rounded walls? If we were to go in that door, kind of in the center of the picture, we would be in the library rotunda. And once we stepped into the library rotunda, you'd notice a series of oak pedestals stand about that high, and on top of each one of those pedestals, there's a bronze bust. And then if your gaze would turn upward to that high ceiling, you'd see in, in bold white letters the words, Society of World Changers. See, at Indiana Western University, we take world changing seriously. Most of the folks that are employed at Indiana Western University, if you ask them, what's the university about? They wouldn't say, well, we're about education. And they certainly wouldn't say, we're about passing out degrees. What they would tell you is that we're about changing the world by building the next generation of world changers. Uh, that's an exciting venture. That's an exciting thing to be a part of. And I've been there long enough now to begin to see some of the fruit of that and begin to see how some of that is happening. Every one of those bronze busts represents an individual who has been inducted into the society of world changers. You see, every year someone is invited to campus who has risen to the pinnacle of their career, a secular career. And from that pinnacle, they're influencing the world for Jesus Christ. And those people are invited in, we celebrate them, and then we induct them into the Society of World Changers, including unveiling their bronze bus to put in the Jackson Rotunda. Not long ago, uh, I stood there before those uh, 10 bus of 10 people who had been inducted into the Society of World Changers. Some of them are people whose name you would recognize. Have you ever heard of a, a, a fellow who uh, grew up in a Nazarene parsonage in the South and then became a radio talk show host, a guy by the name of Jim Dobson? Mm -hmm. Jim Dobson was, of course, one of the early adoptees in the Society of World Changers. Football fans, wake up. Have you ever heard of a guy named Tony Dungy? Mm -hmm. Tony Dungy was on our campus a few years ago. I got shaky his hand. You can touch, you can touch me like you At any rate, Tony was inducted into the society of, of world changers. But as I stood looking at those bus, I began to see a pattern. I began to recognize that not one of those persons was born to greatness. 
Not one of those persons came into the world at a place where people were saying, wow, I wonder what's going to become of that individual. Not one of those persons stood out in their early days. And in fact, as I stood and, and, and looked at those bronze busts, I began to recognize a, a pattern, not exclusive, but, but oftentimes, that these were individuals who had come through some pretty difficult circumstances. There is there a, a bust among those of a fellow by the name of Ben Carson. Ben Carson was on our campus several years ago when nobody had heard the guy of Ben Carson. Uh, except to those who watched the early morning programs and heard about him bringing together a team of doctors who separated Siamese twins joined at the head. When doctors around the world said it can't be done, Dr. Carson said we have to try. <clears throat> and in a very, very delicate, extensive operation, he saved two lives with that team of individuals. What we didn't know, or I didn't know, until Dr. Carson began to share with our students from the, from the lecture of the chapel, was about his earliest days. See, Ben Carson was born in 1951 in Detroit, Michigan. He was born to a single mom. His uh, father had already abandoned the family before Ben was actually born. Ben's mother had been married to the man since she was, hear me, 13 years old. And so when he left, she had no marketable skills, no way to make a living. She couldn't even read and write. But she was determined that she was going to provide for her two sons and give them a better life than the life that she had known. So even though she couldn't read them to evaluate them and grade them, she insisted that both of the boys submit a certain number of book reports every week during the summer. Ben was angry. Ben was angry at his mom. He was angry at a dad that he'd never known. He was angry at life. He was an angry kid on the streets of Detroit. If you've ever seen the movie Gifted Hands, you know the pinnacle of that, the, the turning point in that movie, is when Ben, in his anger, lashed out with a knife against a playmate over what station they were going to listen to on the radio. And that knife got tangled up in a huge big belt buckle on his playmate and the blade was broken. And Ben went home that day recognizing that he had been spared and thinking that perhaps he was spared for a reason. He knew that except by the grace of a God that he didn't even know, he would have killed that boy over which station to listen to on the radio. <coughs> it was from those kinds of beginnings that Dr. Ben Carson became the chief of pediatric neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins University. And from that vantage point, became a world changer. A few years ago, we honored this man, True and Kathy, born in 1921 in Atlanta, Georgia, to severe poverty. True and Kathy's dad had already lost a farm to the bull weevil. And in 1929, he lost the second farm to the stock market crash. Truett says that his dad, his earliest memories of his dad, was of a man who sat in a darkened room and stared off into space, unable to communicate, unable to interact with the people around him. Truett's mom, on the other hand, was determined to see her family through. And though he had several brothers and sisters, Truett's mom, in a two-bedroom, one-bath house, began to take in boarders in order to make ends meet. Truett told the students at Indiana Western University that his first remembrance of a job was when he went downtown to a, a place that sold Coca-Cola by the bottom, and he'd buy cold Coca-Colas for a nickel, uh, for a quarter, six pack for a quarter, and then he'd sell them in affluent areas of Atlanta for a nickel piece. And he'd take that five cents profit, take it home and give it to his mom to put in the kitty. Truett thought he'd found his break when he and his brother started a restaurant together and things were really going well. I mean, he was making money and he was, he was going to be somebody. That's what he said to our kids. I thought I'm going to be somebody. And then his brother was killed in a tragic airplane crash. And in order to settle with his brother's widow, he had to sell the business just to make ends meet. 
Truett Cathy died a few years ago. His son Dan now runs Chick-fil-A. That's the business that Truett Cathy started and that got him a spot in the Society of World Changers. The pattern I was seeing as I stood there before those bronze busts was also evident in the life of this young lady, Johnny Erickson Todd, who in 1967, this date, was a vibrant, alive, energetic teenager, horseback riding, swimming, tennis. Those were her main activities. And then you know the story how a tragic diving accident in Chesapeake Bay left her unable to move from the neck down. And uh, Johnny stood on the platform, no she didn't, I'm sorry, she sat on the platform uh, of our chapel and talked to the kids about depression. Talked to our young people about, uh, about the fact that she tried to find someone who would help her take her own life. She said, I wasn't even physically able to kill myself. That's the story that we don't talk about much in evangelical circles. She talked about how she overcame that through the grace of God. Today, has written more than 40 books, has starred in a movie, and has audiences held in rapt attention, literally, around the world. Now, as I saw those three people and thought about their story, I came to this conclusion. Life circumstances are not a life sentence. It's possible to rise above the circumstances of life. It isn't necessary to continue to live the way the circumstances of life, of life have caused us to live. We can do better. We can rise above our circumstances. And I'm convinced that the best illustration of that anywhere in Scripture is a young fellow by the name of Joseph. Just to recap quickly, you remember his story? 17 years old, when his brothers sold him into slavery. The big debate among the brothers while they were eating lunch was, shall we kill him or sell him? And they finally decided that they'd just go ahead and sell him because there was a little money in that. They sold him, their brothers, but they sold him into captivity in Egypt. He did okay in Egypt. He began to rise above his circumstances. He began to show evidence even in those early days of overcoming. And then, his boss's wife made a pass at him. We'll look at that in some detail, either tomorrow or Wednesday morning, as we talk about overcoming temptation. Joseph knew how to overcome temptation, but he ended up in prison for a crime that he refused to commit. And while he's in prison, he finds a buddy who's got a, got a contact on the outside. Tell the Pharaoh when you get out that I really don't belong here. Help me get a way out. And the Pharaoh forgot him, or excuse me, the buddy forgot him for two years. And he languished in what the Hebrew scholars tell me is best interpreted, the hole. He languished in the hole because he was rejected and forgotten. But that same kid was elevated to second in command of all of Egypt. That same kid saved two nations. The nation of Egypt and the nation of Israel exist today because of that youngster's overcoming ability. And I'm convinced this morning that you and I can practice the things we see in Joseph's life and we can be overcomers too. No matter what the circumstances of life have dealt you, you can overcome. You can rise above. You can be all that God intended for you to be. So let's look carefully, just for a few moments this morning, at what Joseph overcame, and then how did he do it? First, what Joseph overcame. Joseph overcame family issues. This is the, the essence of the dysfunctional family. You remember the story? His daddy, Jacob, tricked his brother, Joseph would have known him as Uncle Esau, he tricked Uncle Esau out of his birthright and out of the family blessing. And the tensions got so hot in that family that Jacob's mom said, you better get out of here. They're trying to kill you. And so he went down to a neighboring country to visit Uncle Laban for a while. You know, they say whatever's going around comes around. 
the one who tricked became the tricky, that's the word, <laughs> became the one who was tricked. He fell in love with Uncle Laban's beautiful daughter, Rachel. And uh, he said, Uncle oh, Laban, I really want to marry that girl. Now, when I picture Uncle Laban, I picture Boss Hall. He's <laughs> <laughs> a you know? I, I, he's, he's always, he's kind of talking about a big old cigar and he's going to make somebody a deal. I'll make you a deal on that girl. Boy, you ain't never going to forget. I mean, we're going to work this thing out. I, 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 I'd like for you to have her. I mean, you might as well be one. So anyway, he cuts a deal with Boss, or I mean, Uncle Laban, <laughs> for the beautiful girl, Rachel. And I, I, I don't know, and I think it's probably too delicate to talk about anyway, how it happened. But he was already married to Rachel, and he spent a night with her when he found out that Boss Hogg had given him his sister Ugler. <laughs> <laughs> the ugly Leah, instead of the beautiful Rachel. Now the Bible says that uh, she had delicate eyes. I, I don't do Hebrew. Hebrew did me for one semester at Asbury Seminary, and I don't do Hebrew. So I don't know uh, what that all means, but I went over to some of the best Hebrew scholars in America who are in the next building from me, and I said, guys, and translate this for me. Help me with it. What is this delicate eyes thing? And, and one of them said, well, it's uh, almost impossible to translate. It must be a Hebrew idiom. It's got something to do with eyes. We know that, but there's just, uh, we don't know. So we talked about it a little bit over coffee, and finally I said, could it be she was a sight for sore eyes? He said, that's it! I bet that's it! So, so Jacob ends up with Leah, a sight for sore eyes, instead of the woman that he loved. And that creates all kinds of difficulties because Uncle Laban isn't comfortable just to give away the girls uh, for seven years of labor. Instead, he gives them a handmaiden who ultimately also become his bed partner. He's got four women trying to be his first woman. <laughs> I mean, imagine the, the, the dysfunction in that family. Now, the experts tell us that dysfunctional families is a multi-generational phenomenon. And the experts say it as if it's a given. This is the way it works. It's going to happen. Come from a dysfunctional home, they say. That's all you know. That's the only thing you can figure out. And so you raise the next generation of dysfunctional people. And since that's all they know, they in turn raise the next generation. The experts then would look at this passage and say, no surprise there. Jacob raised a bunch of dysfunctional kids. I mean, they're fussing with each other. They're feuding. They're plotting death for one of their own brothers. They're jealous. They're angry. But Joseph. But Joseph. Joseph's different. And you know, I'm not an expert in that, uh, that area of study. But I've known a few people in my life who are different. People who said, okay, that's the kind of family I grew up in. And that's the very reason I don't want to have a family like that. I've known some folks, and so have you. I can see by the nod of some of your heads, who said enough is enough. This will be the generation that breaks the dysfunctional cycle. And I've known some of those people pretty well. My wife is one of them. Who came from an alcoholic home and, and uh, very uh, permissive kind of mother and said no. And while I was off saving the church, she raised three kids that are ministering to them. It doesn't have to be the way the experts say it is. Joseph had some tremendous family issues to overcome. In addition, Joseph overcame some fairness issues. Now you'll notice when you read these chapters in anticipation of our study, that special verse that is highlighted in many translations, where it says, And Joseph whined, well, it's not fair. <laughs> you know that verse. <laughs> Have you seen that verse? 
Well, that's because that verse isn't there. It wasn't fair. It wasn't fair at all. But Joseph wasn't one. Joseph didn't want about unfairness. I've come to recognize that life is not fair. And that's true whether you're a believer in Jesus or not. If, uh, if you can't recognize that truth where I'm going, I, I want you to know I'm going to pray for you because your time's still coming. It seems to be a near universal that life is not fair. A couple of weeks ago, I stood with a good friend before the casket that held the body of his son. A boy that had all kinds of advantages. Economic advantages, opportunities, handsome kid, just, just all kinds of things going for him. But he did not have the emotional strength to deal with a tour in Iraq, a divorce, and the death of a child. It was more than he could deal with. And he took his own life. And as I stood with my friend and we looked into that casket together, we said almost simultaneously to each other, it's just not fair. And that's truth. It is not. Why one individual should have those kinds of weights is beyond comprehension. It's not fair. I remember many years ago when I was a young pastor, a telephone call that came Mother's Day evening from one of my parishioners. And he said, uh, Blake, can you come? Steve's been killed. Steve was his 17-year-old son. The story as it developed was that Steve had been racing home on Mother's Day evening, trying to tell his mother Happy Mother's Day before she went to bed, and trying to be a curfew that his dad had imposed because he'd been pretty late the last several nights. He'd spent the day with his girlfriend and was now up against the clock. And the sheriff said he failed to navigate a curve at a high rate of speed with death in the scene. That's not fair. 17-year-old kids aren't supposed to die that way. 25-year-old pastors aren't supposed to have to help people deal with that. And parents aren't supposed to bear children. Life's not fair. I was a pretty old guy before I learned that. Older than I should have been. I should have figured it out. A little more than five years ago, I was gathered in the conference room in the office complex where I worked at the university. Students had just gone home after the fall semester. It's what we call Christmas break. It's a wonderful time to be a part of the university campus. No students, but you still got your own library, your own swimming pool. This is a great place. And so we were celebrating. We called it a Christmas party, but we were really just celebrating when the students had left. <laughs> and my phone and my phone rang and Nancy was on the other end. And she said, Honey, the lab report came back. I forgot we were waiting for a lab report. I'm really not that bad a husband, but I just I just checked out. The lab report came back, I have cancer. And so we began to walk together on a journey that was the most uh, difficult time of my life. Nancy's fine. We got an appointment uh, two weeks, which would be uh, the five-year celebration. The doctor will say she's fine. He said it for all he's coming up to that. So she's okay. But I didn't know that. 
she did, by the way. A few weeks in, the Lord gave her a verse. This sickness is not unto death. And in my anguish, I thought to myself, now I've got to deal with her refusal to deal with reality in addition to dealing with losing my wife. Then it would be uh, it would be so great for this setting if I could tell you that I rose above all that, played the great hymns of the faith on the car stereo, and led Nancy like a family leader is supposed to, as we dealt with this trauma. It would be great, but it would not be true. She handled it emotionally very, very well. And I didn't handle it well at all. I didn't play the great hymns of the faith. You know what I played? I about wore out a CD of Daryl Worley singing Sounds Like Life to Me. And every time I would play that song, I would remember that I wasn't singled out for abuse. And I shouldn't have expected to be singled out for rose gardens. It's life. It's just called life. And life's not fair. Joseph, more than any individual in Scripture, knew that. And yet we don't find a pity party anywhere. I think he had a CD of Daryl Worley in his cell. <laughs> now, we'll look at that what he really did do. But he overcame the fairness issue. And then third, a bit of a conjecture on my part, and I did that. I want you to know that I believe in the authority of Scripture with all my heart. If it says it in the book, I believe it. It is true. I'm convinced that the Scripture is true and all that it affirms. And so most of what I will teach in these days, I can show you chapter and verse and say, that's why I believe it. This one's not that way. And so I want to flag it for you so that you can come to your own conclusions. The Bible never tells us he was scared. But he's a 17-year-old kid hundreds and hundreds of miles from home, living in a culture where they speak a different language, where customs are much different, and where no one knows the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. More than that, his master has the authority of life and death over him. If Potiphar got up some morning and said, I don't like the color of room you picked out today, he can have his head tracked off. I think it's logical to assume that there were days when he was scared to death. And that makes it for me even more significant that I don't see the fear of a mention. He had it. He overcame it. Joseph overcame a lot of stuff, and we're going to spend several days looking at some of the things he dealt with and overcame.